Olá, boa tarde. Estamos na mistura de dia e tarde, então, é, bem-vindos a todos. Hoje estamos aqui no nosso Lab Lounge, que sempre acontece nas primeiras terças-feiras do mês. É, e hoje estamos continuando essa conversa sobre como criar uma cultura de ESG e inovação. Né? Um, a gente nesse Intralab, a gente está é, fazendo pesquisas e convidando especialistas do mundo todo para um, explorar essa questão, né? como fazer uma junção de ESG e inovação e é, mexer com a cultura organizacional, muito focado também no trabalho que aqui os nossos palestrantes também estão fazendo em termos de intraempreendedorismo, né? Como usar o intraempreendedorismo para criar uma cultura que gera sinergias entre esse e inovação. E o que significa isso para as empresas participantes que trazem esse evento para você, que são a Unilever, a Nestlé e a Basf? É, para essas empresas, a gente faz basicamente um engajamento com a alta liderança, junto com alguns um, entrevistas e workshops para falar sobre esse de inovação. A gente desenvolve as pessoas que querem desenvolver essa cultura, trazendo experiências internacionais, boas práticas, fuck-ups, etc., etc., um, para ver né, como são as ferramentas que outras pessoas usam que estão nesse desafio no prato de criar uma cultura de ESG e inovação. A gente faz um diagnóstico junto com tada, nosso novo parceiro, que é a Época Negócios aqui, a gente usa os dados que a gente está gerando com a época Negócios 360. Então, estou muito grato a nossos amigos uh, da Editora Globo, da época Negócios, um, para se juntar a essa iniciativa, ajudando as empresas, identificando as boas práticas em ESG e inovação. E, né, junto, a gente quer compartilhar o conhecimento a gente vai ter um evento de lançamento do nosso estudo em outubro de 2023, em São Paulo, presencialmente, e espero que muitos de vocês a gente vai encontrar por aí. Hoje, eh, estamos também com novos parceiros eh, institucionais. A gente está com o Pacto Global da Rede Brasil, o Yuno Social Business Brasil, a Liga dos Intraempreendedores, ao ICE, o King's College London e a Craig Barrock, que foi fundado por um intraempreendedor, que é o Gib Bullock, que potencialmente alguns de vocês já ouviram, escutaram, que criou a Extension Development Partnerships. Agora, como a gente trabalha esse contexto, né? a gente vê que muitas empresas têm esses programas que, a partir das competências da motivação dos colaboradores, Uh, desafiam eles a desenvolver novos projetos que misturam uma criação de valor para o negócio junto com um, junto com uh, impacto socioambiental. Esses projetos, no melhor do caso, criam valor para o cliente e, se criam valor para o cliente, devem ajudar a empresa a diferenciar em, no mercado em termos de vender mais, mais receita, menos custo por causa de eficiência com eficiência energética, por exemplo, ou também melhor a, a reputação em termos de ESG e sustentabilidade. Porém, o né, que nos leva muito para esse laboratório aqui é a observação que tudo isso depende de duas coisas, das estruturas organizacionais que a empresa tem para acelerar e identificar ideias e apoiar entre empreendedores, e a cultura organizacional. E dois pontos que a gente vai, ou três pontos que a gente vai olhar particularmente na discussão hoje, é como funciona um funil claro, né? como identificar e acelerar ideias, qual o papel de financiamento via fundos internos. né? Aqui a, o Diego, por exemplo, é, liderou um projeto na Danone, que é o Ecosystem Fund, é, que sim, tinha 100 milhões de euros para investir nessas ideias de intraempreendedores, um, e como é também o apoio da liderança para assumir riscos, aprender dos erros, e até colocaria aqui de ter uma visão um pouco mais de longo prazo. Então, com isso, 
apresento aqui os dois, o Michael Hunkeler, que é hoje é founder e project leader da Inopact.com uh, na Suíça. Ele foi responsável para um programa de intraempreendedorismo um, grande na Swisscom. E a gente tem o Diego Durazo, que foi é, o que é diretor agora Sustainability da Noni North Latin America e que é, por muitos anos também liderou o fundo da ecossistema da Danone. Então, agora, como estamos no evento internacional, vou mudar para o inglês. né? A gente perguntou lá atrás, tá tudo bem para vocês? A votação falou, a, a gente manda em inglês, então, bora lá. So, um, first of all, thanks for coming and joining us our discussion today, uh, Michael and Diego. Um, um, I want to give a short um, time for you guys to present yourselves and say like, okay, what what brought you into the space of entrepreneurship and um, yeah, what, what were your roles in that respect? Maybe starting with you, Diego. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for um, having me. Uh, greetings from Mexico, everyone. So the, the, um, my story with entrepreneurship is... Um, is a bit of a personal story. When I joined Danon, I joined Danon roughly 12 years ago. And um, my my second son was born just around the time. And uh, he happened to develop a number of allergies um, to what at the time we joked about was allergies to planet Earth. So basically everything and anything, especially um, food allergies. And I came across the Ecosystem Fund um, because I found out we were uh, doing a project in the United States with our uh, medical nutrition division. Uh, and uh, it so happened that my kid was uh, using this particular product to get all the nutrients in. And uh, you know that's how I got interested. I mean, in the past I was, um, uh, in marketing, uh, that's how I joined Danon as a, as a marketeer. Um, I worked for many years at Unilever before that, and, but that was the, the, the original path. And, uh, and, and I guess I would say it, life happens and that's how I got into this. And then now, now I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in, in the sustainability world. Cool. Thanks, Diego. Michael, what brought you into this space? Super. Um, also, um, hello from hello from Zurich from my side. Uh, I'm happy you can switch to English. It was it was very interesting to hear so much uh, Portuguese. I really like the the sound of the language. So that's already a highlight for me. Yeah. So what brought me into the world? I think it's a lot of focusing on the main thing um, as a as a topic. So I was originally an economist by training. So interest in the whole big large questions. Then after this, I focused into more consulting. So I did a lot of project management naturally in banking, because here in Zurich, we have many, many banks and insurances. So I, I was fully into that. Through that, then I got to know the Impact Hubs, which is a, a network of a social entrepreneurship community, co-working spaces. And that really focused me then, okay, out of all of this, I really want to do open innovation. So I got to work on startups and corporates. How can they relate? And after a couple of years doing this, I realized that it's still too broad. Um, I want to do entrepreneurship because at that time, Switzerland's largest telecommunication company, which is called Swisscom. They had a big engagement with the impact hubs to bring innovation into the company and how the culture can change. And I was lucky enough to be the program leader for that on the impact hub side. And when it really took off within Swisscom, the telecommunication company, they hired me in um, to help them sell the solution to other companies. So I was engaged in entrepreneurship software sales for quite a while. That was also a new adventure for me but also leading the program. So uh, I was leading the Swisscom Entrepreneurship Program for uh, two years, which had around 120 ideas per year. Uh, we ran many campaigns and I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a very good time to have to work with so many creative people. And since a couple of months, I'm now doing it as a freelance. So I support companies to establish entrepreneurship programs, but also ventures and corporate ventures to scale. I always say like to the first million dollars in revenue, how do you actually get from product market fit to the first traction that you then can say, guys, we really have a business here. We should become our own spin-off. Okay, that 
already sounds interesting and sets us off on the path to say like, okay, how, how do you create revenues of this and um, how do you link that to sustainability? Now, um, a lot of people who are in our center um, are worried about, you know, how, how do I get my leadership team to have a more long-term perspective because of a lot of these ideas take time to mature. Um, and now one of the reasons to invite you, Diego, is just like, you know, you were in charge of a 100 million euro investment fund that Danone who was set up to do this target. Now, um, I, I got from our pre-talk that, that this is not that easy as it sounds. It's not like, okay, you throw money at your entrepreneurs and then, you know, amazing ideas will come out that save the world, you know, cure your little one and provide nutrition for him. So he's not suffering from his allergies anymore. And at the same time, having multi-million dollar revenue. So, so the question is a little bit like, you know, what's the role of funding and how can funding potentially help with the more, safe space or more long-term perspective to say like okay give these people a little bit of space so they can develop their ideas how did that work at at the ecosystem fund diego yeah well so maybe just a little um clarification i, I did not run the whole fund i used to run the the americas chapter um yeah. which was quite a bit of money but you're right in terms of uh, the um, the original size of the fund and how much money Danon put into this set aside. Um, it was a while ago. This was 2009. It was Danon's response to the financial crisis. And uh, it basically um, complemented the other two funds that already existed. So Danon has this very interesting approach to um, social innovation through different types of, of solutions. And each one of the three funds has a different a mechanism for funding too. So, and specifically the ecosystem fund, what it does is it's it's um, its work is um, focused on having a partner, namely an NGO, an expert partner uh, for deployment of initiatives around Danone's ecosystem, hence the, the name. So we're talking about um, micro distribution projects or um, say sourcing, and, and namely around milk because we make yogurt, right? So, um, but this is from smallholder farmers. We have a very large project in Mexico that, that uh, has been running for a very long time. Um, so that that in terms of context, and now to to try and get to the to the question that you were asking is, well, it's not just about throwing money to the problem. It's like it, it's not going to just pop up. Um, there's I think um, a very clear design from the get-go. So this is this fund. This fund's purpose is to, um, you know, help with uh, innovative ideas that may benefit the, um, say, for example, supply of key ingredients, and uh, at, while, while at the same time, this um, will help uh, economically with the. Uh, you know, not going to the usual suspects, the very large farms, but maybe doing it a little bit different. So it's, I would say it's more about not just what you do, but how you do it. Um, and because it's a separate entity, you are allowed to have a little bit of a, um, I'm, not, I'm not say leeway uh, in, in terms of, of timing. That doesn't mean, it's not a free for all. You do have a structure, you have a governance, you have your uh, limits and you have very clear, a good understanding of what the, the indicators of success are. And I think what's really interesting about the ecosystem fund, I was, I was listening to Michael just now, um, he was talking about the size of the investments. Um, and at the time, and, and, uh, and probably even now, there's still, I think, a huge gap between um, you know, your typical development bank project where you start at 5 million, right? And then um, very few initiatives that start at, in the range of 100 or, or, or 500,000 uh, euro. And then there's like a, a different sets of instruments between 500 and 5 million, depending on, of course, on the partners and the size and the, the type of the deployment. So I think that's where the ecosystem fund 
um, made a, made a difference uh, because we weren't talking about hey look, it's not just about spending a hundred million euros and uh, get it over with no it's just about being very precise and limiting the size and having the business units also pitch in this is not just the fund itself it's it's the business units themselves but anyway I'll, I'll stop there because um, I'll, I'll I'll eat up all the time if I keep talking. No, but you know, like this is an, this is another important thing, like um, how to get business involved, you know, because if you like I got from our pre-talk as well, like if you just finance the projects from a central fund, there's a high risk that, you know, they are not aligned with business objectives. So business needs to have a skin in the game. Absolutely. And Michael, that leads me to when we did our interview, um, you said like, you know, most of the projects fail within the first two months. So, um, and after the first two months, um, they present to business and if business is not in, you know, potentially it's over. So, so how was that process organized at Swisscom or how would you like, not going to say like, okay, how was it at Swisscom? How do you see this process ideally happening? Yeah. Um, so about ideally, I'm also not quite sure. I can tell you about my experience, how it worked for us. We had some limitations and, and I'm a big fan of this. Like what really attracts me to entrepreneurship and innovation is like the, the honesty and realness of projects. So we tried in my program to avoid internal politics and fully focus on clients and just really stick to that. And so what that meant for us, how to get buy-in from the management and involve the business, um, we had to think about, okay, how can we, um, make them believe that we're going to create value in the long term. So what I came up with is having like a two pillar approach. We so the entrepreneurship program has a cultural and educational aspect. So it's a fundamental design of being an employee at Swisscom that you can have your entrepreneurship idea whenever you want. So this is like a fringe benefit. We're a cool company. We have the top talent. If you have an idea, you can go anytime. You, you don't need to ask anybody. You, you go out, you get your entrepreneurship idea, you test it. And if it flies, we're going to help you. But we, we try to avoid gatekeepers. So this is kind of a, a culture aspect. And that's already sufficient. So we always say, no matter what comes out of it in the end, this should be enough for the entrepreneurship to exist. Whatever comes later, like the innovation part, is kind of the icing on the cake. And I know this is a bit um, sometimes hard to justify, but if you keep on driving in this way, it makes your life much easier. So how we did it is we had three phases, like it's an idea fund. We had the validation, piloting, and then the scaling phase. And we also said, yeah, we start with validation. Nothing's going to come out of that. As you said, Heiko, 90% of the ideas are going to fail. And that's totally fine because they're going to fail very cheaply. We give everybody $1,000. They go and try. After two months, they come back and they say, actually, nobody really wants to rent drones in Switzerland because nobody cares, right? And so they go back, but they're happy they could learn something and they actually talk to clients. But if they find traction and if they say, well, I talked to 100 people, 50 of them would buy it if it's below 200 bucks a month. And if they could change it, if it breaks, we have a deal. And maybe if we can get insurance in, that's even more interesting. We invest, but we co-invest with the business. And so for me, it was always the goal to get out of the way and just be like, hey, I have this person from Swisscom having an idea. They found some traction. Do you want to sponsor it? It's going to be your baby. Like I can support you, but you guys have to figure it out. So it's not this not invented here. As you said, like if, if we push it too much, uh, we called it overcoaching. So if I would push the idea for six months and then come with a finished product, it would fall dead right away. So my first reaction is always bring people together, let them do, and then kind of be the, the sparing partner on the side. Like every week check in and like, are you on track? Are there some, uh, some hindrances? How can we support that? But then let them do it themselves and let it grow organically. And the later the idea, the more of the funding comes from the business or from clients. Like I have a sales background, so I always pushed for them to be go out, get money from clients, don't do proof of concepts for free, because that's another like behavioral like economics or kind of edge. If you can go to Swisscom management and you say, well, the, the clients want to give us money. They have a problem to solve because now they have to put that money somewhere and they're going to realize, oh yeah, now you're actually talking with one of our clients we have to solve this. It's not a problem. It's actually a huge opportunity, right? But in big companies, sometimes having new money coming in is sometimes seen as a problem. So you can generate a bit of pressure to actually get the project off the ground and decide. 
does it stay within the company or should it be a joint venture or even a spin-off? And so like this, that really helped to, to keep the channel focused and get the ideas through. Now, you know, like that's really interesting. Um, but in our case here, we have the difficulty of bringing sustainability into this spectrum as well. So I understand like Swisscom had an open call. You can bring in any idea. Like how would you, you know, uh, and your organization now is, is called um, Impact, Inu, Inupact. So it's an innovation and impact. So how did the impact come into this? Yeah. Um, so for us, we, I really quickly realized that the program was open 365 days. So even at Christmas Eve, you could start an idea. Next month, you start your journey. Um, but at the same time, we had four times a year strategic campaigns where we said, hey, guys, in Internet of Things, 5G, cloud computing, there's a lot going on. If you have any idea in this area, now is a good time to start. And the thing that was the most interesting for employees was sustainability. Because out of 120 ideas per year, 110 had a sustainability angle. Nobody works at Swisscom and wants to create a new product that does not have a positive impact. And what I could really help them do with my team was to help them shape the story. Like they had a, a vague idea, they want to create something great and something with positive impact. But what does it actually mean? And we focused on how can you align with the company's values? Every company nowadays has an SDG goal, a net zero target, things like that. How can you plug into there? Who are the stakeholders? How do you need to talk to make them realize you add value to them? So like if you can reduce CO2 equivalent, you probably get a lot of sponsoring over the next couple of months and you, you're good to go. But also how are sustainability topics impacting you? Like is your idea something or company should go to, or maybe you're a bit on the wrong track or should you pivot into a more future-proof business model? So we, we incorporated like this. Diego, same, same thing to you. Like how do you mix the both? Bo bo both what impact and, uh, and business? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, in in, um, in in the case of the fund, I, I would say um, it's it's a design thing. When you're limiting, as I was mentioning before, the the um, the type of initiatives that go into funding, and uh, um, you kind of set the stage for for uh, these particular solutions to to come up. Um, there's a, there's a definition on on uh, each charter when when the project is presented for um, social indicators so social and environmental indicators so how many people will benefit from this what is going to be that benefit what do you mean by by positive impact which sometimes is like sounds um just easy but but it needs to go be just beyond being a buzzword right so um, is it just going to be an increase in um, income? And then what's, what do you think will happen then? How do you also equip the, the community that's going to be receiving this benefit um, so that they can manage it properly and, uh, and then somehow guarantee there's going to be some continuity? So, um, what kind of technical assistance are you going to be putting in place? So it's, I think it's, um, it's uh, it's a set of set of uh, activities that are clearing to a specific outcome, and and that's actually what does take most of the time, right? You have to engage in sometimes cultural change, um, and and that's actually what I would say is one of the, one of the main challenges to really match a positive impact uh, as clearly defined as possible, and uh, and and longevity of projects. We are getting now first questions on the chat. The question yeah. here, based on your experiences, what are your main advice? What's the main advice for new entrepreneurs to remain engaged despite of the challenges um, um, they face within the organization and not giving up on the project? Oh, well, let's give some encouragement. Um, I think you really need to know your. Um, your 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 the the type of game you're playing. What is what is it you're looking for, and uh, what are you willing to to do to get that result? I, I think 
to me that the most critical part is understanding what you're up against in terms of um, objectives, framework, and even uh, corporate culture. How does that play into your own um, uh, story? So, I mean, I don't know what what this specific question is is uh, is about. I mean, so I can only think of this very broad broad uh, strokes of uh, of of um, advice. I don't want it to be like just just platitudes, but I think it really is um, extremely important to to understand what the limits are um, in your audience, in your stakeholders, and uh, um, just understand that there's, there's um, that these, take, these things do take time. And uh, sometimes you need to get also this, you, you keep people on board with the same idea as broadly as, 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 it, as, it, as it seems. I don't know, Michael, what, what, what do you think? Um, so I fully agree, Diego. I, I think for me, it's exactly what you said, like getting other people on board with a similar idea. I found that to be maybe the most powerful thing. Like uh, if I had an entrepreneur coming in and it was just uh, one woman with an idea or one man with an idea, I always said you should team up because it's much more powerful if you have like two, three, like a, a, hack, a hacker, a hipster and a hustler, like the classic trio and they go and build it. It's, it's much more fun. I also think... Um, you should see the whole thing. So I think it's also quite a, um, a mental exercise for you. So see it as an opportunity to grow. Don't take anything personal and kind of at the same time detach yourself a bit from the idea. That sounds a bit very um, philosophical, but I think it really helps. Like try to see things how they are. Like if you talk to somebody and they're not supporting you right now, think why is it? Like it has nothing to do with you. They, they don't have anything against you. It's just they have other things going on and try to, to see that clearly then to see, yeah, okay, how can you act differently? Um, I also think what's really good is gamification, like try to take the seriousness out of it. Like in, I think in the business context, everything is always super urgent and super dangerous. And it would be a catastrophe if a client gets delivered something wrong. I think just like letting that go and enjoying the fun of doing something wrong. That's also, it's pretty fun. Like if you, if you do something bad and you have to ask for, for an apology that nothing nothing bad happens you know like you, you can be wrong and then say yeah that was really that was a bad mistake i tried to do better next time and that's that's fine like nobody dies from that um i think these are super important points um and also if i, if I can go back to about the sustainability topic just something that came into my mind um that we had before at least here in europe and switzerland i think this topic is going to be much much bigger in the coming months i'm not quite sure how it is in mexico and, and brazil but here we have new regulations coming in that all companies will have to report on it. Um, it's going to have a lot of consequences if you don't do it properly. So this will mean it will be measured, it will be managed, and there's going to be a lot of budget behind it to actually get stuff on the ground. So if you are in a big company and you have new ideas how they can become more sustainable, um, I think it's going to be a very good time for you. Now, Diego said something which is, um, you know, you're, you know what you need to be up against, corporate culture. You know, and power games yes. and stuff like that. And now, you know, question to both of you. If you were like to leave your organization and you start a new one and you want to evaluate its environment on ESG and innovation and entrepreneurship, what are the three things you look at? And say like, you know, I, you know, th this makes me work there or not work there? That's, you're yeah, playing hardball now, Eiko. That's uh, not fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the easy questions I ask other people, you know, I have you guys here. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the short answer is, um, I don't know. And I, and, and uh, I, I mean, you, you know, you, you probably get to a certain age where you 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 learn what your limits are again. So I've been taking, I've been talking about this, uh, uh, and, and I'm trying to build on what uh, Michael was saying too, and and my answer to to um, Aline's uh, question. Um, what are those limits in 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 um, at a personal level? 
and uh, how can you play within those limits to get to where you want? Um, I mean, Michael said something that I really like. He said, um, and 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 please correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. If I if I if I if I don't get it right, but you said something like, "You can be wrong. You accept that you can be wrong." And 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 the way I I I, uh, I would like to reframe that is you're allowed to recalculate. Uh, it's I've I've done it uh, many times. I, I listen. I. I started off my career as originally a chemical engineer. I started off in finance, then moved to marketing, and then switched to um, the the fun thing. Uh, and then you know, it's like I'm not I'm not I'm not saying it's the right thing to do. <laughs> it's just, but I can I, I can speak uh, about my own experience. And and every single time, um, ultimately things just fall into place. Uh, but I think that's also because there's certain guidelines and certain limits on on uh, on the type of, um, of of stuff that interests me and that that keeps me motivated and there's obviously a very pragmatic and practical side to it all does it does it make sense or am, am, am I just gonna I don't know um, throw caution under the wind and and, uh, and become an artist and uh, I don't know, maybe Michael and I will start a jazz band after this call. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Very likely. <laughs> um, so I'm, 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 um, I don't know, Hiko, if, if I'm answering your question or, or I'm just beating around the bushes. Let, let's, let's listen to Michael. Let's see what he says. And then we go from there. Yeah, well, I had now the, the benefit of having two minutes to structure my <laughs> thoughts, so I appreciate that. And I came up with a smart answer. Now, uh, serious, like if I um, if I look for other for other company and try to assess it. So first of all, I have to believe that like companies are not monolithic, especially larger companies. They are very diverse, and you can have incredibly different experiences depending on where you end up. Like if you if you join GE. Like there's so many departments, you're going to have a very different department depending on where you are. So that being said, I, I would look at like success stories, um, see what did they actually produce? Like in, in the area of entrepreneurship, did they have successful spin outs where the innovators also got some share, were they able to grow? Do they innovate nicely, like as you want it to be? Um, so that's a good indicator because then you actually see, do they get it on the ground? Um, I'm a big fan of asking the network. I think that the older I get, the more and more I realize how important that is. I think as a as a very young person starting out of the uni, you, you probably cannot do it. But after some years in the industry, I think that's the best proxy I have in my network. I have maybe five people, which I just know I really care a lot about their opinion and they know certain areas. So if I'm puzzled and I would ask them, hey, what do you think about Swiss Re? How, how are they doing? What, how do you see them? And they give me an answer. I believe that carries some weight. Um, and I would listen to that. And I would ask several people as well to get some indication. And I would take that to heart. But then, last but not least, I would try to be concrete. So if you go to a company and you have an interview and you want to have your own entrepreneurship project, um, try to pin it down, like not to get lost in this whole company. And then maybe you, you cannot get the opportunity again. You can say, yeah, I would like to join you and I would like to be in your foresight team as well, 20% and try to work there. Could we do that? And then if, it, if they make it happen, that's a very good sign. And if it's more like avoiding, then it, it doesn't really count because again, it's going to be your journey and you have to make sure you can actually engage in a large company. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Uh, now we have Guilherme coming in and I think that it also plays to something I heard before because um michael was able to build a community and and um have a community of 2500 entrepreneurs at swisscom i don't know like if there's a as as well an alumni community of the ecosystem fund oh, yeah. i guess you might have something similar um first like you know what's the use of such a community and and how to build it how to engage these people you know how how because it's I realized like as well after our talk, Michael, last week, that there are administrators and there are in entrepreneurs and a company needs both, you know, um, but how to get the right people engaged and not wasting your energy. And 
you know, move them forward and give them something they can contribute to. Yeah, um, should I go first? Um, I think, so for me, that's really a topic I, I love. So again, like I'm from, I have a bit of a sales background and that's something I discovered that I could do as leader of entrepreneurship program that I wasn't aware of before. So I had like this pool of, in the case of Swisscom, 17,000 employees, and I could approach them however I wanted to convert them into entrepreneurs. So that was a kind of a cool challenge. And you can really map their journey out. So like you have in the sales process, you can think about how do they learn about you? What, what's your brand? How do, what kind of contacts do they have? How do, how do they get interested? How do they find you? How do they enter your funnel, so to say? And in the funnel, maybe to touch upon that exactly, we had some very clear roles defined. So you could be, of course, an entrepreneur, then you have your own idea. You could be an expert, then you support idea. You could be a sponsor, then you finance ideas. Um, or you could be an ambassador of the programs. These are handpicked of all the departments that have a very good network as a kind of um, super multipliers of our content. Having these roles together and then really thinking, okay, we have, so we have five roles. And for each of these five roles, we know what we are doing. Like they hear from us once a year, once a month, once a week, once a day, maybe, and really think about that through very well. And I found that super motivating. That's fun to do with your team because then you know, okay, we also had a platform like the Ready entrepreneurship platform where we could track. And so at the beginning, we had 1,000 members on it and it was just a goal. Like every month, there should be a couple of hundred people more and you could actually do activities to get them on the platform and convert them. Um, so touch points are, are super important. Then if you think about communities, I think multipliers are important. So um, now in sales, you often have the flywheel approach rather than the funnel wheel, uh, funnel approach. So it's not your task to push as many things in, in the front and then some fall out, but build something that accelerates itself. So if you have people in your community, make them talk about it, make them share about it, talk about them. You have a, you have a great voice within a company normally, like everybody loves innovation, entrepreneurs. These are the juiciest stories. So your company will be happy to share them and that generates traction for you for free. So you have to think about that. And then like overall, I think communication is just key. Like no matter what you do, you have to keep communicating and communicating well and clearly about it. Never underestimate that. You have to keep on saying the same thing over and over again. And maybe last but not least, I think maybe that's even most importantly, like the brand you put out, I would say stick to your values, like make sure what you stand for. So at Swisscom, we really stood for full focus on client centricity. So it doesn't matter what I think as a program lead, it matters what the client thinks. It's open to everybody and it's very gamified. So people just knew we are this space where they can be crazy and everybody's welcome. And that really helps to spread through the company easily and then the community grows. Diego. Sorry, I was trying to unmute and was taking notes. Um, thank you, Michael. Now you gave me some time to think about this. And, um, and, and uh, I, I think it's easier said than done, right? Um, and you know, you say something like, you know, make it personal, uh, understand what the incentives are. Um, I th to me, I think, uh, well, you heard, you heard my story. I was just telling how I ended up doing what I did. But to me, it's all about the stories you tell and how you, how you tell those stories. Um, I think the way the question is, uh, is um, structured is, is uh, very telling. There's an impact that is generated by the actions. Okay, so what is the story behind that impact? And it's not just a number. It's uh, you got there somehow. There's stuff that you had to do as a, as a human being. And I think it's, it's about uh, how you did what you're uh, uh, talking about um and and there's i think always an angle when it becomes personal would be when when you touch on fundamental human decency or or you know what i like to call was principles <laughs> um and 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 empathy and how that is connected and it doesn't have to be super complicated so this is this is what we did and, and maybe not just 
boast about the result, but say, and maybe we're just doing um, the best we can. And, and this is why we're doing this. That's, that's the only way in my experience where it works, because if you start just showing off and throwing numbers around, that doesn't make any sense. It's about the story. It's about the depth of the story. And, and in, in, uh, in my experience, that's what, that's what works and, and, and builds engagement. Yeah, maybe adding to that, I think Diego, yeah, that's exactly also what I think. Like, if you, you you have to get away from just throwing numbers around and kind of this bullshitting thing, because there's a lot of that already around. And um, I think people behave like you you treat them, right? So if you do this as just like human decency, and you you see them, and you trust them, and you believe in them, and you create a space where they can be creative and fail they will realize that they can do it. And, and that's also contagious, that, that will spread and they will appreciate exactly that. So I, I fully agree with that. You have to stick to your values and just stand up for that. So it's also about creating a narrative and not throwing also numbers only. Now we look up to you guys, you know, Danon has, has created all this fund and supports entrepreneurs. Swisscom has the kickbox challenge, you know, um, you created that, Michael. If I ask you, to whom are you looking up to? When you say like, you know, who's, who's a reference in this for you guys? Who, like, where would we look at? Or where do you look at? When you say like, you know, if, if I look, if I would be at this level, you know, I would be playing different game. game. Where are the trends, like, Where's the future looking around the corner? Um, I'm going to tout my, my corporate horn and I want to speak to, to you know, Danon is, is, a, is a fairly young company. The, the, the foundational cultural speech of, of, of the Danon company that I, I work for is uh, only roughly 50 years old. Um, and it set the stage for uh, uh, this idea of a double um, uh, purpose, just economic and social then, and how they're intertwined. And, and uh, it sounds a little bit cliche, but I, I do sometimes come back to those very few pages um and i think what matters is is to put those words also in context uh, your, your question was specifically who do you look up look up to well i think the this uh this particular guy is antoine ribou guy in in the 70s was was quite a character and and there was extremely disruptive when when what he said at the time was uh I, I can say it didn't necessarily sit well with the establishment, right? But it doesn't mean it was um, absolutely revolutionary. Again, it, it drew back on what I was talking about before, just common sense, basic, again, fundamental human decency. There's a question in the chat, how do you deal with the ones who do not have the same sense of decency? Um, well, it's not, not always easy. That's exactly that's that's the whole thing. It's it's a that is the journey, actually. Facing those difficulties and learning how to just sometimes you just can't convince everyone. Find a different path. Be like water, man. I don't know. <laughs> Michael, you want to come in on this? That's it's a good question and I, I really want to reflect about this more because I, I love uh, like thinkers and, and books and reading but now that you ask me I, I couldn't name you one person that I really look up to I guess where I experienced it the most for me was probably in the impact hub network but it's also very heterogeneous like people live it differently but this they have a manifesto and I think the manifesto really resonates with me where I see it going because it's it's not too deep it's about like being open like being okay with yourself and like being 100 human in every interaction not trying to like to project something that you are not and i think that's the crucial thing 
in the business literature, like if I think where the problem really lies is would for me would go pretty far back, like the whole neoliberal stake, like shareholder maximization thing is probably the fundamental flaw that many companies just really focus on revenues. And I think we have to get back from this where we see now companies are more complex and they're also a place where people work and that create multiple things. So we have to let them a bit more fluid. Um, so more like humanitarian thinkers that, that put humans in, into the center rather than seeing people as instruments to be optimized. That, that would be my very convulsed um, answer. <laughs> And I think, like, how do you deal with people with, with another um, who have not the same kind of decency? Maybe um, the person can elaborate what they mean, but if I understand it correctly, that they may misbehave. I think that's also super important that you also this, like, don't take it personal, don't lash back, but also don't be too soft. Like, if, if you look at your program and you know the value of the program and what you stand for, uh, draw some clear lines, like say, well, if somebody abuses funds, for example, or does not really live up to it say okay i'm sorry this that, that was the experience but i have to draw a line we cannot continue like this um i would also stand up for that well I, like i i i had once a, a case of an entrepreneur and she was basically um, um boycotted by her colleagues in her oh. endeavors and and she realized that this always you know like the first time she was very angry and try to get rid of the person, but because of political reasons, she couldn't. And um, then she realized that, you know, there are always some different types of people in any organization you work, some love your project, some boycott your project, some say that it's nice, but they then boycott you. Um, and she detached herself from that and said like, okay, if a person behaves like this, this will be my answer. This is my strategy. You know, if a person behaves like this, this will be my strategy. I think like that really works well to say like, okay, if I see this and this happening, of course it's personal at the first moment, especially if you're passionate about your project, but then maybe, you know, it helps to detach and say like, okay, in that case, I push strategy number three and see if I can, if I can do this work around. And I think, you know, to what you said, Michael, in these moments, it's very important that you have a network inside with other people who do share your values and you can consult with and say like, okay, what, what are potential workarounds here? And how can we make sure that, you know, it becomes at least visible that this person is not acting based on the same values, which in the ideal case are outlined in the founder statements like Anton Ribot and Danon they outlined in the 70s. Um, I think that's a very good point. Also here, I would just like to say, like in my role also, I had some moments where I thought people don't behave correctly and I I was close to be a bit angry and kind of, you know, like put them in place. But afterwards, I also realized that they were in a place of where they were not doing well. Like they had really their own challenges. And if I would have known that, like you can treat them with much more compassion and be like, hey, this is just not the, the place we, we should be doing it. I think that also happens quite a lot. Now, there's a question in the chat about tools, and um, I'll, I'll use that to broaden it a little bit, you know, because at the, the League of Entrepreneurs, for example, we always talk about two types of entrepreneurs. There's the entrepreneurs who, you know, do better processes, create new products and services for the marketplace, new business models. These are normally the more visible ones and the heroes because they realize the projects, they make new revenues or they reduce costs or whatever. But then there's a second type of entrepreneur, which we call the catalysts, who do this arduous work of working on most of the people here are potentially of these catalyst nature. So like, okay, how can I create a more conducive culture in terms of ESG innovation that helps impact entrepreneurs move forward? And if I look at the toolbox for the entrepreneurs, they have the business model canvas, they have the SDGs, they have the theory of change, they have, you know, they have a lot of stuff they can work with. Now, if we look at the tools you guys as catalysts have, what would you put in the toolbox? Or what do you would say, like, you know, these are the most important tools I'm using in order to drive this culture change forward? Not sure who wants to go first and 
earn one, two I'll, minutes to I'll think try, it out. I'll, I'll take a step. <laughs> um, yes, I think there's also a, a, another element on Guilherme's question about the larger the, the group, the more difficult it gets. Absolutely, yeah. And the larger the group, sometimes you have to start to oversimplify and then it, it gets diluted and it gets more complicated. So I, you're absolutely right. The, um, on, on the bigger front of, of, of tools, and I'll, I'm gonna go back to one of the questions before is, so you know what your own personal limits are and what's the, the, the field and what are the rules of the game ahead of you? The better you know those rules, then the easier it is to uh, either follow them or circumvent them. But, and it sounds again as an oversimplification, but I, I think it can be um, explained like that. What are the incentives? What are the motivations uh, in your audience? And, and what happens not just after the first question is after the second or third question. You have to be ahead of that of that game and 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 be flexible. I think ultimately that's what I like about this this um, this type of uh, endeavors and 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 my job because it's not just circumscribed to one little element of transactions. It's it's a set of um, of consequences that will ultimately lead to. Uh, a positive impact or or a good result. There was a question before on uh, uh, in becoming a unicorn for entrepreneurs. I don't know what that means anymore. And in 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 this day and age, um, is there an equivalent for entrepreneurship? This word might be just thrown around easily. I think it's about identifying those levers that you can act upon to enact positive change. Um, and again, it, it can be as broad or as, as simple and as specific as you want it to be. It could just be one specific project. Maybe it's a larger, more cultural um, engagement that you're, you believe in strongly. But then again, it's, it's, um, it's a game you have to play. And ultimately, it's, just not, it's not just about the end result. It's about every day. It's, it's the journey. It sounds again like a, I took that from... A, uh, self-help book but <laughs> it's true it's true Michael now you yes, have time I, yeah exactly yeah I also think um, definitely focus on the journey like make it make it so that you already already are in a good place because there's always always going to be like the next milestone and you're going to chase like the next thing and then you're always going to be stressed out so I think yeah as a as a catalyst try to make them aware that this is exactly where they wanted to be like this moment like this challenge they have right now this is good this is a good place and then i think this gives resources as well um i think also along with that i would try to give them as much ownership as possible it goes back to this thing about not over coaching so make them feel in control um that also means for me taking me outside of the process like they should never have the feeling they should, they have to pitch to me or I'm the one opening or closing a door for them. I'm just like, there is a sparing partner and they're to blame if it succeeds and they're to blame if it doesn't. So it's all on them. And that, that makes it more interesting to keep motivated because they're the ones that saying, okay, we continue or we do not continue. Nevertheless, it's good if you can give them on the other hand side, the roadmap. So if you can say them, well, I feel if you can really get this revenue or this commitment or this partner in, you probably are ready for a spin out and like you can discuss it like this and you you can give them scenarios so they feel ah, okay this is kind of like the game so if i manage to do this in six months then we're going to talk again and then we can decide this way or the other way and then we enlarge the team so that means we get more funding and my job my job changes and last but not least i also think if you're on this journey and often they take a long time it's also good to celebrate these milestones like not to forget to say hey take a moment, breathe, like you have been on this for six months now, you achieved a lot of things, take time to celebrate, you know, go go out for dinner, do a, do an activity and just be okay with celebrating what you have done already um, and then have energy again for the next steps because otherwise it's just like uh, Groundhog Day and you're in the grind every day. Cool. Folks, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks you so much, Diego, for all your inputs here. I think... Um... 
uh, we can take it from the comments in the chat, like people are really enjoying it. Um, I don't know if you have any last comments, suggestions, tips for the folks here. Any last words? <laughs> Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the ride. Yeah, I, I would really say just try it. Um, don't overthink it. Go with like if you have a real passion for it. There's no reason to be like ashamed or think, ah, oh, maybe the idea is not good enough. Just go out there, learn from it, pivot, and it's going to be be a good journey. And if you can help people doing that, that's even more rewarding. Totally agree. It's and to me, I would try to summarize it in one word and think like ways and recalculate as much as possible. Cool. Thank you guys. Now, just to let you know, guys, um, I'm switching back to Portuguese. Vou anunciar a próxima, a próxima Lab Lunch é também primeira terça-feira do mês, em julho. Agora vamos mudar por voto de nossos apoiadores aqui para no horário da uma até a duas da tarde. A gente vai estar com o Rodrigo, que hoje é diretor executivo do Sistema B, que algumas empresas estão usando como uma ferramenta para influenciar a cultura. E ele também foi o ex-CEO do Ben Jerry's. No Ben Jerry's aqui, desculpa, tem uma erro aqui de digitação, mas é Ben Jerry's, é, ele foi o CEO e agora é, vai falar com a gente sobre a jornada B, que né, fecha bem aqui com chave de ouro, porque é It's All About a Journey. So, hope to see you again next month. Vamos ver vocês de novo em julho. Uh, agradeço de novo aqui a Diego and Michael. Thanks, guys, for being with us. And um, have a great day. Enjoy. And all the best for your journey in your organizations. Bye-bye. Obrigado. Adios. Obrigado. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Valeu. Obrigado. See you. <laughs>